Very pleased to welcome to the show. He's in our virtual green room right now, Dr. Robert Renneker. And he does something that I think is fascinating. He's a department head of biomedical engineering, and this is at UTD. And they're doing some wild or cutting edge research, I would say, on the brain. How often have we talked about the brain on this show? And they're taking a different approach, kind of an entrepreneurial approach to solving medical issues with the brain. Dr. Renneker, thanks for coming on America Tonight. Thanks for having me. As you approach this, did I do a good job in describing that? Tell us about the the research, the, the way you're approaching your research on the brain. What we know is that the brain is extremely pliable or flexible. It, it can be modified with learning and behavior. In fact, everything that you've learned, everything that you are, is all stored in your brain somehow. And what we're doing is we're tapping into that ability to learn and to reorganize to treat neurological conditions. And we're partnering with clinicians and companies to develop technologies and therapies that we can move rapidly from the bench top in our labs to a clinical setting where we're actually doing clinical trials. Wow. And so the kinds of things that you're working to to help patients with, is it things like patients, for example, who have lost a limb? Yeah. So what we know is that, say you have, you listen to your iPod too loud and you have damage to your ear. You're going to have a lack of input from that part of your ear to your brain. That part of your brain is going to be sitting there going, I don't have any information coming in. So the surrounding regions are going to move in, and they're going to become hyper-excited. And it's going to generate something called tinnitus, which is the perception of the sound when, when there's no sound there. And what we do is we, we have a therapy we've developed where it shrinks that area back down to reduce tinnitus. And there's a similar thing that happens with an amputation. So when a patient uh, loses a limb, there's a lack of input from where that limb was, That part of the brain that usually processes that information says, hey, there's no input, the surrounding regions move in, and you get something called phantom limb pain. And so the therapy is designed to be able to reorganize and reshape the brain to treat the the bad plasticity that occurred after the accident. And at the same time, we're we're developing therapies for things like stroke, where if you have a loss of part of your brain, maybe we can move functions of your brain from one area to another to help you regain the same function in your arm that was lost due to that stroke. Um, so there's, you can imagine there's a wide range of applications for this since we are our brains. I'll tell you, one area, too, and I don't know if this is something down the road for you, but as you know, Doc, it's such a big problem, Alzheimer's, dementia. Any possibility of, of using technology in your research to work in this direction eventually? We are actually doing some, some knockout models in, in, in animals where you basically genetically modify the animals so they get those disorders. And we're looking at, I don't know that we can actually prevent them from occurring, but we may be able to slow their progression. So we know that through exercising your brain and things like that, there are ways you can reduce the onset of some of these disorders. And so we're hoping we can, we, basically we take the therapies that have already been shown to work and we add our technology to that to try to slow that down even to a greater extent. So. I don't see us solving that problem. I think that's a, a much more complicated and a much more difficult problem. But uh, I, so I, I, I'm not as enthusiastic about us being able to solve that in the next 20 years. But um, I think we could extend the quality of life for patients who are suffering from those disorders. Oh, terrific. What about, is there something if somebody was explaining to me that you're working on called visible speech? Explain your visible speech project. What does that mean? Okay, so if you have some sort of brain damage, whether that's a traumatic brain injury from getting hit in the head from playing football or if you were in Iraq and you were near an IED or you had a stroke, what can happen is you can lose control of your tongue. Just like if you have a stroke and you lose control of your arm, you can actually lose control of the muscles that control your tongue. And also you can't, sometimes you lose sensation, so you can't actually feel where your tongue is in your mouth. And so patients that have this disorder, which is called dysarthria, are unable to produce speech. They can't talk. They can understand speech, and they can hear it just fine, but they can't produce it. So we've developed a system where we put a set of sensors on the tongue, and then we project a picture or an animation of their tongue, of avatar or a 3D frame model like you see in the movies, on a screen for them to see their own tongue. And inside, that tongue is a position inside of a 3D head model, and if they turn their head and move their tongue they can actually see where their tongue is in space. And then the therapist can work with them to position their tongue correctly to make sounds, uh, to, to make speech sounds. And so it's a way to provide visual feedback for patients who are, are struggling and trying to recover from speech therapy. 
Wow, very, very cool. Are you finding that, I um, mean, obviously the word is starting to, to spread. Are, are you seeing that more people are becoming aware of the research that you're doing and uh, how far you're really trying to push this and, and the results you're seeing and ultimately, you know, what the goals are? In other words, are you starting to get uh, recognized? Is the program really being recognized for what you're doing? So I think in the scientific world, people recognize the power of what we're doing. And if you watch TV, you'll see commercials like, uh, what is it, Posit Science, and, and there's other companies with brain training, those yeah. sorts of things. And those, those are mental exercises that probably use some of the same parameters that we're using to, to improve cognitive function. But we're basically uh, um, putting that whole system on steroids with our therapy. And, and the clinicians recognize that, that the potential there, because currently, if you if you have a stroke or some other neurological disorder, there's not a lot they can do for you. Doctors will put you on medications to treat the phantom limb pain or the chronic pain or whatever it might be, but they know they really can't cure you. So this is this is the first time in history we believe where there's an opportunity to actually cure neurological conditions by reorganizing the brain. And and the way one of my colleagues describes it, it's, it's sort of like the development of the vaccine where before the vaccine, you would, you would get some virus or bacterial infection, and it would basically kill you um, because your body didn't have the ability to fight it off. But if you were exposed to it with the polio vaccine or one of these other vaccines, your body develops an immunity, and this is called a plastic system. The immune system adapts. And in the same way, we're, we're, we've developed a technology that basically allows you to adapt and allows your brain to adapt uh, to these neurologic conditions. And so we, we view it in that same light, that it's, it's similar to the revolution that occurred with the development of vaccines. Wow. All right, we're speaking with Dr. Renneker, and we're talking about uh, the brain is so important. You know, we're seeing, we just saw this in, in the NFL. They had a big settlement because of the amount of hits players were taking and some of the diseases that they were developing, like ALS, Parkinson's, and whatnot. There still is or certainly was, and you're right in the middle of this, very little that we knew about the brain. Is, isn't that, do you think that's true? Like, especially when it comes to athletics or did, or, you know, I guess this is a different kind of discussion, but uh, people either chose to ignore it or didn't realize what was happening. But now uh, it, to you, is this a, just an awesome thing that people are focusing on the importance of the brain and the things that happen to the brain? Yeah, well, so part of the reason that there hasn't been a great focus is by the time you see the onset of dementia or Alzheimer's, there's a large portion of the brain that's actually been damaged. And so you can actually sustain a lot of damage to your brain, and your brain is designed to adapt and reorganize. And so you may not see deficits. So I know when my grandmother, she was she had Alzheimer's and she passed away from it. Um, but during the process, we could see her slowly cognitively decline, but it didn't occur until she was about 82. But I guarantee you, if I had the technology at the time and we were able to image her brain, I could have told you probably five or ten years before that she had some sort of dementia or Alzheimer's just because of the structure of her brain was changing. But it was able to adapt. And now we're starting to realize, same with these these players and, and a lot of these kids that are in these very uh, aggressive sports that <laughs> hitting your head multiple times is probably a bad thing. And we're not sure why. So we, you know, there are studies that have instrumented football players and looked at the amount of force that's been imparted on their heads. And it doesn't seem to be correlated with whether you had a concussion or not. There seems to be something else and we just don't understand it. And part of the reason is the brain's just so complex. So you have a billion neurons and you have a hundred trillion connections between those neurons. And it's those connections that really determine how the brain functions. And so it's a very, very complex thing. And we, we're at the infancy of understanding how the brain functions. We know where functions are. We have some ideas of gross functions, but we really do not understand it at all. Do you foresee, Dr. Reniker, a time where, I mean, wouldn't this be wild where people would actually go and and occasionally get a photograph of their brain. Go get like a brain checkup. I know that's probably way down the road, but it's it's kind of like getting a full-on checkup of a different sort when you go to the Mayo Clinic or wherever and they look at all parts of your body. But do you foresee that maybe there'll be a time where we actually have a brain checkup, almost like eye checkups and whatnot? I know with Obama's initiative that they're talking about trying to do something like that, and I don't know what kind of information you would actually get from that, but I can tell you what we're doing, and in, in part with um, 
uh, some football teams, we're, we're developing a neuro triage system. Basically, a, it's a device you, you wear, and it does a, a series of tests that examine your neurological function. And it gives us sort of a snapshot of how your brain's functioning. And the idea is we, we do this test before you go out on the football field or whatever sport you're playing. Um, and then if you sustain a, a hit of some kind, we can pull you over, do the test real quick, and get a, a sense for the neurological status of, of the patient. And then the idea is we probably can't prevent these, you know, NFL players are going to bang their heads against each other. You're not going to stop that, but you may be able to stop the damage by saying, okay, well, you had this kind of hit, you need to come out of the game for a day or a week and, and give your brain a chance to recover before you get back in. So um, I, I don't, I don't, the brain is so complex, I don't see a day you're going to image every synapse and every connection, but I do see a day where we're going to be able to assess neurological function in a much more um, tightly controlled manner uh, that is going to provide us a way to um, help prevent further damage. Very, very cool. Dr. Robert Renneker, uh, thanks so much. Doing some wild research at the Texas Biomedical Device Center at UTD. Thanks. We appreciate your time. Thank you.